You have to talk this way. Okay. Ariel? <laughs> Ariel, do, do you hear us? Uh, uh, switch on your, your microphone, please. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good, how are you? Thank you. Okay, everyone, we will get started. Uh, we have a special guest joining us virtually. Uh, Dr. Professor Ariel Mako uh, is a professor at the um, university. Give me one second. Stockholm. Stockholm. He is specialized in European history, particularly Cold War uh, history, uh, but he also is uh, one of our experts on diaspora, Syrian studies, and, and particularly history. Those of us in history, I, I think we're a smaller community. Uh, we have many more scholars in Semitic studies and linguistics, uh, and Ario is uh, really one of the prominent historians we have who not only looks at European history, Cold War politics, uh, but all intellectual history, but also uh, diasporic Assyrian involvement, Assyrian identity, uh, and really important subjects that uh, all of us really uh, work on, cite, and, and refer to his scholarship on ethnicity, uh, identity, and such. So I welcome Ario, we all welcome you to join us uh, with, uh, with his presentation on the Assyrian diaspora. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Sound okay. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Apologies for not being with you today. Salam alaikum. I really want to be present uh, for various reasons. This work mostly in the Muslim So I'm happy to be with you virtually to speak about an idea, more or less, that I have how to approach, how to research the history of the Syrian in the, in the modern era. And I look forward to, to hear your, um, which have uh, amounted in different articles and, and book chapters and so on, on, on smaller episodes from different parts of the world where Assyrians uh, have formed diasporas. And some of the, the larger research questions amounting from, from that more fragmented work uh, that I would like to, to address in a larger research project uh, would be how did the Syrian diasporas emerge and develop in the modern era? How can we understand similarities and differences between various diasporas? What have interactions between Assyrian diasporas looked like? So just some, some basic terms. Um, diaspora describes a type of ethnic and or religious minority. Diasporas are populations with intergenerational connections to an area of origin, often characterized by a traumatic history of migration. And their transgressive loyalties, relations, or orientations distinguish diasporas from other types of ethnic and or religious minorities. And this is um, Niswan's definition of a diaspora. And I think everybody in the room or on Zoom um, immediately identifies, of course, um, Assyrians with this kind of, of definition. Some features uh, of a diaspora from the IOM World Migration Report. Diasporas can be defined as, quote, migrants or descendants of migrants whose identity and sense of belonging have been shaped by their migration experience and, and background. And diasporas are usually characterized by most, if not all, of the following features. One is migration, of course, from a country of origin in search of work, trade, or to escape conflict or persecution. Second is a collective or shared memory, idealized collective memory and or myth about the ancestral home. A continuing connection to a country of origin, or in our case, uh, countries of origin. A group consciousness, strong group consciousness sustained over time, and kinship sense of kinship with diaspora members in other countries. And again, I think it's very obvious to everyone in the room that Assyrians um, bear uh, signs of, of these features of diasporas. There are different, different types of, of diaspora as well. 
and sometimes one of one diaspora actually bears the signs of, of various of these uh, types um, uh, of, of diaspora. Uh, Cohen's typology, um, his book I think is called um, Global Diaspora, an introduction, um, offers um, victim diaspora, labor diaspora, trade diaspora, imperial diaspora, and cultural diaspora, uh, some categories. And in the case of Europe, for example, you see maybe a blend of, of victim diaspora with refugees that fled war and labor diaspora with an earlier generation of, of migrants that came for work. So one, one challenge, one, one major question, uh, initial question maybe to, to think about when conceptualizing such a project would be whether to speak of diasporas in plural form or one global diaspora. And if we look at some of the cases, uh, some which go back to, to the 19th century, uh, mainly Russia and the Americas, sorry, but also the 20th century in new waves into the Soviet Union, Europe and Australia, 1950s and 60s, some of the more, some of the younger diasporas. Um, that is a question that's up there for discussion. I'm, I don't really have a decided opinion. I think it's more correct to speak of diasporas, also because some of them existed for decades without actually interacting with other diasporas or even being aware about them, with the exception for, for a few intellectuals. But, but that is something that, that can be discussed and that I would like to discuss with, with colleagues. Do we actually have one diaspora to speak of or do we have several. Um, then what tools can we use actually to, to approach the subject, to, to study this history, the history of, of the Assyrian diaspora? And I take inspiration from the field of global history, which um, Sebastian Konrad, one of the most prominent global historians based in Berlin, um, defines as a form of historical analysis in which phenomena, events, or processes are studied in a global context. And I think it's very hard to understand the, the evolution and in some cases even the establishment of certain Assyrian diasporas if you don't put them in a global context and look at uh, how they uh, affected each other. Of course, vis-a-vis the, the area of origin vis-a-vis -vis, um, events and evolutions in, in present day um, Turkey, Iraq, Syria, Iran, and so on. Um, global history is a historical subdiscipline which has been on the rise since the acceleration of globalization in the 1990s, very prominent field. And nowadays with, with various prominent journals, um, a lot of money floating into the field an infrastructure that has quickly seen global history rise to, to, to the top of, of the historical, of historical scholarship as a whole, and which also is not limited to, to modern history. But you also see, um, could be Luther, Lutheranism. I saw one, one book, follow one research pro project recently, which was, um, which was about the 16th century put in a, in a global context and Martin Luther's actions in a global context and so on. Um, so it's not something that, that only looks at, at, at modern history, but also go goes back in history and, and tries to put um, well-researched subjects in, in, a, in a global global context. Global history puts focus on entanglements, interactions and transfers beyond nation state borders. It surmounts the limitations of methodological nationalism. For, for instance, I don't think you can understand the Assyrian diaspora in, in Germany and some of, of its struggles if you don't look at, at what happened in, in Sweden uh, years before. And I think the same can be, can be said about uh, the Northern American and the Southern American diasporas. Global history also resists traditionally dominating Eurocentrism, includes non-Western sources, perspectives, and actors. So I think it's a, it's a good way of approaching the history of the Assyrian diaspora. 
a few words about sources then, and, and some of these examples, but not all of them are uh, from the, the earlier Mara project, uh, which uh, Jeffrey Kahn from the University of, of Cambridge sponsored for many years, um, and, and which allowed um, some colleagues and friends and myself to, to gather and digitize important sources. So these are two examples of, of Syrian uh, journals from the uh, Russian Tsarist era and uh, the early 20th century United States. Other examples of relevant sources are of course, um, collections of local associations. Um, many Assyrian associations around the world have some sort of local archive, could be anything from reports in the local media that reveal a lot of, of um, or about the, the, the group in question, the local community, to um, minutes of meetings, protocols, act, act, activism reports, other stuff um, that's quite in, in, interesting to put in, in, into a broader perspective. So these are, these are two examples from, uh, from my actually local uh, association in, in Augsburg, Germany, where I was born and raised. Private archives, um, uh, like this one, which was provided to me from uh, Stan Shabazz, and which shows his, I think, grandfather who visited Germany in the late 1920s uh, for study. And his, his stay in, in Germany also resulted in, in publications uh, about the, the Urmi dialect that, that are known to, to some of the colleagues present uh, today. Digital sources shouldn't be underestimated, some of which have already disappeared, but are at least partially uh, stored and, and accessible through different search engines, even today. Um, some of which have been, I think, stored by their uh, earlier uh, hosts. So this is, for example, the Yona community, which was quite popular in, in the German-speaking countries about 10, 15 years ago, then disappeared or was, was basically uh, thrashed, yeah, by the rise of social media and, and other Facebook and, and, and other channels that... that change the, the communication, digital communication even uh, within communities such as ours. But there are interesting, interesting I think, digital platforms, social platforms um, that should be included in this kind of, of historical study. Anal analytical tools then, um, I've earlier worked with and, and found uh, very useful uh, a model offered by, by German sociologist uh, Har Hartmut Esser which uh, points to different layers of integration. And I'll talk to the, to the four um, that you see here on the second line. I don't know if you see them, my, me moving the mouse here. Yeah, you do. And I have translated them into English in the, in the next slide. And so he divides integration, ESSA divides integration into four layers. And the first one is a culture, acculturation, the acquisition of knowledge and cultural skills, including the language. So a group uh, arrives in a new country, establishes itself, tries to accommodate, learn the language. The second step is, and, and the result of that is, is early cultural integration. The second one is placement. So occupation of professional societal positions and the pro provision of rights, such as citizenship, electoral rights, and so on which uh, can result in structural integration. Third layer is interaction, establishment of social relations with the majority population in daily life, uh, which can lead to social integration. And the fourth one is, is identification with the, new, with the new society, the new home country, some kind of emotional devotion or identification with the uh, social system or the new society, becoming part of the we feeling in the new home country, maybe feeling some of the national pride that the majority population feels. And this leads to emotional integration. And these are, of course, 
processes that that take um, a lifetime for some uh, generations for others and sometimes are actually not accomplished so we see very different results on these different uh, levels of integration in different cases uh, of the Assyrian diasporas also and of course um, there are different out outcomes of that so su successful integration on all levels is, results in something called um, double integration or, or um, um, successful integration on, on, on the several levels when, when you succeed to, to maintain the, the, the integration with, with uh, your, your own heritage and to integrate in the new society. So you, you successfully retain your own language, some of your own traditions while also successfully integrating in, into new society. Um, if you integrate well into the new society while giving up on your own heritage, then that is the outcome of that is, is often described as assimilation then as we have seen in, in South, South America. Uh, in some cases in South America, then you see that that diasporas, and this often happens to to smaller communities, of course, because it also has something to do with with the numbers, whether there is a critical mass that can be assimilated. But then you speak about assimilation. Um, if you if you fail on both accounts, then um, the outcome has been described as marginalization. So on, on the one hand, you lose a lot of your own heritage. On the other hand, you actually do not integrate uh, in the new society, but you rather end up on the margins of that new society. So examples of that can be seen in, in, in suburbs uh, with, with obviously failed uh, integration processes in, in yeah, various European countries. A um, bit different from what we see in the United States, but that also can be discussed. But if you look at some suburbs, Banlius in France or some Swedish suburbs, then you see cases there where maybe the Assyrians are, uh, are dealing with, with uh, what has been defined as marginalization. And then the fourth one is segmentation. So that is when you, when you successfully retain your own heritage, but fail to, to integrate in the new society. So, so this could be a tool, this matrix to use when you kind of try to see similarities and differences between different Assyrian diasporas in different parts of the world um, and some of the analytical tools. How do you then? What what are what are we what are we looking for? What is what is allowing us to to analyze the degree of, of integration? Um, I would say social cultural practices. Um, you look at the at the degree of of language that certain communities retain. How is that reflected? you see sometimes um, a change over time in, in Assyrian publications, start out mainly Assyrian or maybe Assyrian and other, other Middle Eastern languages, and then tra transition uh, in integrate the language of, of the new, uh, new society, and maybe in some cases uh, drop Assyrian and or the other languages, uh, Middle Eastern languages completely. Um, Labor economy says a lot about placement. So do we see success stories? Do we see marginalization? Um, how is this, this addressed? Uh, there are interesting sources about this that allow us to, to get some kind of, of picture uh, about the, the degree of success of, of various diasporas. Um, how do we celebrate? How do we revel? And, dancing, singing, remembering, do some tales survive in publications or, or just in, in, in the activities of local communities or do they disappear over time? Um, religion, of course, uh, relationships, sex, marriages. I remember a very interesting article from 1934, I think, maybe the 1930s in any case, from um, an Assyrian publication in the United States second generation which address you know the new and the old ways of 
of being in, in, in relationships, what's acceptable for, for a Syrian youngsters being, how to look at, you know, consummation of alcohol, but also um, partying, yeah, sexual relationships, marriage, and these kind of issues are, uh, are discussed in, in, in a very interesting way by, by uh, very often first or second generation um, Assyrian youth in, in, say, the United States or the 1930s or Europe of the 1980s. Uh, very interesting stuff there to be studied in depth. Food, leisure, just to give some examples, but I would say social cultural pra practices say a lot about the, reveal a lot about the degree of integration of a community and could be a way into the kind of sources. Uh, one example is also sports. I mean, these are just the logotypes of some, some uh, uh, Assyrian football clubs. And when I say Assyrian, I, I, I mean all names that are used by, uh, by our people, different communities, of course, um, all the symbols that are used. Uh, so some, as we know, use um, triple, double slashes and all kinds of, uh, kinds of stuff between Assyrian and other terms, such as Chaldean, Aramean, Syria, and Syriac. And as you know, there's a battery of that. Some of them actually turn to uh, like the one um, or the, the two below in, into integrating um, also non-Assyrian symbols. Some of them actually move on to, to drop uh, Assyrian names altogether. And this, this can be seen for different activities, not only, not only sports, but I think it also reflects the degree of, of integration, uh, the symbolism, uh, the names and symbols that are that are used. So you can you can see that nicely in in some of them, the sports associations uh, formed by by a Syrian diaspora or in the Assyrian diaspora. So finally, uh, be, before I conclude here, uh, some of the the challenges to to such a such a research uh, project or research projects, um, resources of course for once is there's something to do for for one scholar or a team of scholars, I'd say preferably a team of scholars, but as we all know, that requires uh, major funding, um, which could potentially be interesting to some of the, the, the major uh, funding donors, uh, not least in the West, who are interested in understanding uh, immigration, uh, integration and, and diasporas better. So there are, there are Western governments who I think uh, are interested and could um, provide these resources, but that has to be seen as a, as a scholarly challenge, <clears throat> not a political one. So I, I don't really believe in, into government funding as such, but into, into scholarly funding through both private, but also um, government funding uh, bodies. Um, the sources as such, very diverse body of sources, very rich, um, easily for one scholar, but maybe also a small team of scholars to drown in the sheer amount of sources that is there. Access to the sources as such, uh, I know very few uh, people who speak all the languages necessary to, um, to use all these different sources. So that, that by itself suggests that maybe this is too much to, to, to take on for, for one individual scholar. Um, there are social taboos. I know of colleagues who have tried to, to penetrate some of the, the social practices that I mentioned with um, questionnaires and so on, and who have been criticized for that because they have touched upon subjects that are viewed as, as a taboo still in, in some of our communities. Uh, the lack of scholarly exchange, and of course, the, the Nineveh chair and, and the initiative taken by, by Professor Afremil, this is a, is a welcome uh, initiative here that hopefully will, will change uh, the situation that, that many Assyrian scholars or scholars interested in Assyrian studies feel exists today. Um, disturbances, put them in quotation marks here, don't know, maybe there's a better word. But um, yeah, all kinds of sabotage from within the community actually uh, that, that uh, scholars 
interested in the community have experienced and uh, yeah we can go into that or not but i think everybody who's worked on assyrians or tried to work on assyrians have has experienced this from kind of destructive criticism to 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 sabotage by anything from getting in in touch with 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 colleagues of yours or or with your employee and and so on uh, and then of course bias uh, bias of sources, bias of your own as a researcher. In my case, clearly an Assyrian bias because I was um, I was raised in an Assyrian home and 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 in in an Assyrian cultural association. So of course there there is there is a bias on my own part as well. So these are just some of the challenges to to this type of research project. And I'll I'll stop here. Uh, thank you, and and I'd be happy for any kind of comments and questions. Thank you, Ariel. Uh, let's open it to the public. Uh, questions you have, any language would be acceptable. Dr. Robert Korakian. Wait, wait, wait. I can give up. This is on already. the state or the majority society are actually failing to integrate these communities and then there the danger i think is you know this kind of marginalization because these community are these communities are threatened by losing much of their own heritage while not even integrating into a majority society but rather integrate into some kind of of um of marginalized uh, group in suburbs comprising of, of different immigrant groups um so i think there is a there's a good chance that a lot of institutions that we have will, will su survive in uh, one way or another, but many of them may be emptied of their, um, of their earlier uh, value and, and, and role they played for the community. So I, I don't really think that where you see, you know, um, cases of, of tens of thousands or, or, or um, hundreds of thousands of Syrians in, in in one city, sometimes making up five, 10, 20, or even more of the population as a whole, that, that they are going, going to assimilate and just disappear, especially not in the digital age where you know the, this collective memory um, has um, is being revitalized in, in, in a different way. And also where, where, as I said, integration, this emotional integration is, is failing. So you can, you can very often see that that communities not only assyrians but but others as well kind of retreat to their original identity um, but there are other dangers to these communities
course also in retrospect uh, we we have to to say that that after what has been a, a very tragic history of course um uh, the 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 jewish diaspora has been a very successful one uh, both in revitalizing the nation building process um, because as you all know um the movement that that actually uh, led the Jewish people to establish a, a state in the modern era, originated in in the in the diaspora. Um, at the same time, I see more parallels with with other diasporas um, from the countries of of with with the same countries of origin, um, because what I lack in comparison to the Jewish diaspora is you know this this. This, this common goal or, or project. And of course, I know that even among Jews, there were uh, differences and conflicts. Not everybody was uh, in support of the Zionist movement, for example. Um, but still, the, the role of um, um, knowledge, the resources actually put into uh, knowledge um, is something that is very different in, in the Assyrian case compared to to the Jewish case, um, and it's it's our maybe our our largest problem. Um, then, of course, I mean the conditions in general are very different. Um, so I wouldn't go as far as uh, to to discussing you know the role of diasporas in 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 the political question as such. But but if we just look at you know how to to be successful as a as a diaspora or as diasporas, then I think there is a lot of a lot of lessons to be learned from from the Jewish experience and and a lot of mistakes that that the Assyrians keep doing over and over and over again. I think more than anything, in the end, um, a nation is you know it's, it's it's the it's the sum of of resources invested in uh, into into the nation itself. So uh, I see a lot of materialism, but very little resources, you know, put into in, in into knowledge in into, you know, the the uh, maintenance of um, Assyrian culture, Assyrian heritage, Assyrian literature, Assyrian music, very few, you know, financially well equipped institutions that the work on on um, um, the different areas um, that you know constitute basically um, collective identity. So I think it's it's um, more than anything the Jewish experience is something that we can and should learn from. Thank you. We can look at it from a um, linguistic point of view, where our language is actually under threat in the moment itself, but revived and uh, purified in diaspora. Even though everything has an expiry date in diaspora, I fully agree with you on that. Um, whether it's 100 years, 200 years, but if I look at it from a positive point, we got education, we got free speech, we got a lot of interaction, and I have met more people, more Assyrians from Iraq that I probably would have met them when I was living in Karabi. Do you agree with these aspects? Oh yes, absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not negative on uh, on diaspora and existing, partially existing uh, in, in diaspora, and actually at all. that you know diaspora means assimilation. Yeah, I don't think so. I think that the, the risk is, is that diaspora could mean marginalization for in, in many cases. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not negative and regardless of whether you're positive or negative, that's just the way of the work that you know there is going to be movement and there are certain diasporas and there are there to stay. So I, I'm not negative about that yeah. at all. What I am negative or critical of is is um, what Assyrians 
as a as a collective group or as collective groups if you uh, if you like um, do with the, the resources at their hand I think that as a specific diasporas there could be much more but absolutely um, everything you said I agree with and, and we have to be very thankful for you know uh, many of these countries that harbored us and allowed us to develop in that way. Can you still hear me or? Yes. I am too. I am too. And talents. You see Alda, you see Ario, you will see Nanicholas, you will see Sargon. This is the hope. And we have specialists in different fields. This is what we have to focus on. Now my question to you is because uh, there are so many questions that uh, you could give uh, an excellent answer. After your analysis, uh, Matte has on the line, yeah, we have to look for the positive aspects of the diaspora, of course. Of course, we have probably become much more conscious of being a serious than ever. We have to recognize if we were in, in our homeland, probably we were just Christians. No definition of a nation was really taken seriously. Now, uh, you analyze this after we have an experience of it about less than 100 years, no? In diaspora, in Europe, they are about 100 years in the United States. After your uh, deep study, how do you see the current situation of the Assyrians in diaspora? I mean, as a whole. As I told you, I was asking you. Uh, do you hear me now better? Yes. Yeah, okay. After your analysis, how do you see the current situation of the Assyrian communities in diaspora, uh, what should be done in order to keep alive and strengthen the connection with the homeland? Because we have to have always a reference. Otherwise, you know, the, it will endure at about 200, 300 years, but then it will vanish. So how is the situation now and what should be done in order to keep really this hope for a regaining as the Jews, as Abdul Masih said, the Jews at the end they got their nation, they got their territory. So what should we do as Assyrians? I mean, I think everything that can be done is already in place. You see very active um, communities, you see these different exchange programs, organizations that, that visit um, that, that the Jews and the Jews and, and so on. Um, but I mean, you also have to, to, to realize that there is always going to be a diaspora. I don't think that, you know, the, the diaspora is going to disappear, to be honest. Um, not even in two or three hundred years. I think it's there and it will survive. It may, as I said, lose maybe um, much of, of, um, of our own traditions, the language, some of the connection. But I think in many cases, of course, not in all cases, but in many cases, it's, it's there to stay. We also have to realize that, that actually a lot of the the, the uh, or, or that the states uh, in 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 the homeland uh, that that they have um, played a, a destructive role in in our nation state building process and we know of you know Iraqi agents that were revealed very active individuals in the Assyrian communities uh, I, I'm not I'm not morally judging anyone some of them you know uh, pressured in, into playing this roles, some of the confusion, some of the division, also originates, you know, in uh, in the state apparatus, state apparati, where where we come from. So I think that you know, regardless, again, regardless of the the political question, whether there is going to be a, a, an Assyrian nation state or not, I think that the diaspora 
with or without uh, a connection to to our air, areas of origin has to have um, a greater interest in you know successfully integrating while retaining its original heritage and the only way that can be done is you know with and maybe i'm cynical but is with resources i mean there are just too many members of our communities that do very well um and too little resources you know going to assyrian activities of, of different kind um we have a lot of talk about you know uh, activists and and leaders and and you know these um kind of um individuals that are going to lead us to to salvation and and so on and uh, i don't believe in that at all i mean one of the lessons to be learned from the jewish experience is that you know is that big money is going to jewish issues and that could be anything could be scholarships for you know um, um Jewish youngsters it could be going to Jewish studies, could be going to language, music, literature, you know, anything that that is part of the identity. So it it, it really comes down to the questions, are we going to have um, an in, you know, a, a class, um, an say economic upper class that wants to, you know, fund these issues or or, or not? And and I think in in that case we we should we shouldn't be afraid to to divide the 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 challenges in the diaspora from the challenges in in the homeland. That there is an interest to have a vibrant uh, Assyrian community in diaspora, regardless of the state of of affair in 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 the homeland. So to me, it comes down to resources. between um, rural urban migrations, even within the state, uh, Middle Eastern newly created nation states in the, in, um, in the Middle East, so rural urban migrations uh, in Iraq and in Syria and other places. So I don't know if you have any uh, suggestions. And I know sometimes rural urban migrations do happen from you know, uh, rural areas in the homeland to actually European states. So it's not always um, uh, state between state, urban to urban migration. So uh, that was a, a really good model. The second is is the diasporas, um, and, and I do like your idea or the presentation you had of, of diasporas. Um, I sort of think of them as networks, you know, in the World War I period, we have the diasporas are better studied, I think, perhaps because we have digitized newspapers and collections. Um, um, uh, these efforts have helped us look at some of, some of these models. Uh, the, these networks in different cities created newspapers that I, I know you're, you're very familiar with. Um, perhaps the digitization efforts can be taken a little bit further where we can search these you know, engines. It's difficult because we're working with different languages. Uh, and you, can, you can look into themes and, and you know, what are they talking about. But the diasporas seem to be quite engaged, at least early on at the turn of the century. You can argue also at different political um, the 20th century is another period where the diasporas are engaged together. So it could be political issues uh, affecting the homeland that, that connect the diasporas. But what else do you see? What, what other themes are they discussing? If you can sort of look at the networks of the diasporas um, engaging together, how are they engaging together? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, response, response to the first, first question. question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there are very interesting uh, comparisons to be drawn to, you know, uh, rural urban migration as well. I mean, in the case of Turkey, Turkey and, and, and so on, we see people moving to um, to provincial capitals like Mardin and, and how that affects, the, you know, their placement, their economic situation, but also their identity. All of a sudden, you know, it's a there is some kind of of, of uh, local identity that replaces, you know, the the the, the identification with their with the original village and so on. Um, so yes, absolutely. I mean, it's always you always should see um, identity as um, as the sum of different different layers, and not as a, as a, a monolithic block or 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 something. And you should also see integration as this 
multifaceted uh, process, and that's the case, case both when when people move from uh, from um, rural rural to urban areas, because it all, it usually is in that direction. Actually, it goes, uh, and and when they when they move to to, to other countries, um, and um, I mean, as for you know the exchange um, between modern Assyrian diasporas but also studying them in general. I mean, we have to be careful when we work with the sources. So if you study, say, the, the Assyrian community in the West in the early 20th century, or if you, if you study the Assyrian community in, 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 in Sweden in the 1960s and 70s, and you do that through you know, the early Assyrian publications, who is producing them? That's Assyrian intellectuals. So they have skills that 95% of, of the community actually do not possess. They have, um, you know, a lack of edu uh, or a, a degree of education that the rest of the community doesn't have. They very often have, you know, advanced ideas that are more of an idealism than a reflection of, of the reality. So that's also an extrapolation, you know, of things. Um, you, you have to kind of cross study. You have to try and, and you know, compare that to... You know, other other sorts uh, of sources could be, you know, official statistics that maybe reveal a, a different picture than than the one we we find here. Could be, you know, be government bodies. So uh, you, you look at some cases, not only Assyrians but also others. You know, you look at state archives. You know how they how they um, different uh, government agencies look at look at various immigrant communities, and then you look at these, you know, sources produced by by the immigrant communities themselves. So, so you have to be careful when you approach these diasporas to start with. When look at looking at the interaction again, I mean, there is very often uh, the the further you go back in history, um, th there isn't always uh, you know extensive uh, exchange between these communities. It's it's often um, a, a small number of individuals. So sometimes it even comes down to one or two individuals, you know, that would um, say in, in enlighten other diasporas about you know the state. Of the Assyrian diaspora in Brazil or in in Argentina, so sometimes it's it's really a matter of of, of um, very small communities. In in other cases, and 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 in the end of the towards the end of the 20th century or the early 21st century, you see you know larger exchanges. Uh, the World Wide Web, the internet is there, and, and the different diasporas start to learn about each other. And, and we also actually have been part of these exchanges where you know. Um, uh, Syrian diasporas from from Europe and the United States come uh, into closer contacts that developed also to contacts with uh, uh, with the communities in 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 the homeland. Um, so it's 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 very limited to begin with, uh, limited also to to political and intellectual issues. I'd say, um, with the exception, of course, um, of of diasporas um, that are kind of in reach. So so. I, I think that the, the picture may be very different if you look at, say, um, Soviet Russian diaspora uh, and their context with Iran and so on. If you have access to that, that kind of sources and, and look into that kind of history, then there may be more of a, a vibrant exchange, more of a you know, continuous movement and knowledge about each, uh, each other uh, there in, 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 in that region. Um, but, but for... Uh, on, a, on a global level, I think there was very little contact, very little exchange until quite recently and, and limited to, to political issues. Now it's changing much more uh, social issues, cultural issues, youth exchanges, sports events, and so on. questions Thank about you. but we are out of time i really encourage you all to look him up he is one of our top published scholars not only in european history but he is also has uh, articles on assyrian identity as i mentioned uh, an edited volume a book on uh, assyrian diaspora's continuity and such so um really we were very grateful um for your presence with us even virtually and we hope maybe next year we will see you here with us thank you maybe before that thank you thank you very much Ariel, Barbara, Vassima, thank you very much for the excellent uh, uh, conference, as Alda said. And next time, uh, whether your university wants or not, you will be with us. <laughs> so just uh, we will now schedule it in order to ensure that you will be face-to-face -face because we would have uh, you know, much more 
interesting yes. questions while we, we are drinking a coffee or uh, having meal or dinner. So next time, I hope that we will have you among us and I'm sure we will enjoy your presence. Thank you, thank you, Todi, Todi. Thank you very much. Thank you, Todi. And we ask you to stay with us. We have a second presentation now. We will be joined, is he with us? Yes. Um, by another wonderful scholar and, and, and colleague and friend, uh, Nicolas Algiru, who's joining us from Turkey. He will tell us exactly where. I'm not sure exactly where he is right now, but he can explain. Uh, Nick, Dr. Nicolas Algilu uh, is a professor at Kader Has Istanbul University. Uh, he will talk about Assyrian heritage and preservation strategies in Turkey, but a little bit about him. Again, uh, all these scholars really you need to look up. Uh, Nicholas is um, a scholar who has a PhD in Syriac studies. Uh, he is um, a, an authority on, on many topics, including the history and the heritage of Urmia. Uh, he's one of the, um, I would say, few, if, if not only, scholars who has done, in, from our generation, a lot of research in Urmia uh, and documented uh, a lot of its heritage. Um, uh, today, he will be talking about Turkey, um, and, um, and we're very, very happy to welcome him with us virtually. <coughs> Thank you, Alba. Thank you for the introduction. <laughs> I hope you can all hear me. Is this the first time you are here? Is my voice clear? Yes. 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 Okay. okay. Lovely. Um, firstly, I want to thank the organizers of this conference, and I apologize for not being able to come. However, I am right now in Hakkari. Greetings uh, <laughs> so, to all of you from Hakkari, Turkey. Um, and my talk today is going to be about Assyrian heritage pre preservation strategies. And firstly, I'd like to start with an introduction about Assyrians in Turkey. Now, undoubtedly, Turkey is a country within which a large portion of the historic Assyrian homeland falls. Uh, it is home to the headwaters of both the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, as well as a large portion of northern Mesopotamia, and of course, the Hakkari highlands where I am right now. Uh, some territories now within Turkey have thus witnessed a continued Assyrian presence since the second millennium BC. Turkey is therefore home to ancient Assyrian provincial capitals, such as Tushkan and Nasibina, uh, which later became an important center of the Church of the East and Syriac Orthodox Church from late antiquity until the Middle Ages as Nasibin, um, he can also be found Haran, which was the last Assyrian imperial capital after the fall of Nineveh, as well as the city of Edessa, modern day Urfa, capital of the Abgarid monarchs who were crucial to the birth and spread of Syriac Christianity. Significantly, the earliest dated text in Syriac, which has been the liturgical language of most Assyrian churches since the beginning, let's say, for the last 2000 years, um, is an inscription dated 6 AD, and it comes from the town of Birejik on the Euphrates River here in Turkey. Moreover, the patriarchates of the four main Assyrian Syriac churches during the last two millennia can also be found at various sites now located within the country. As such, tangible heritage sites can be found here in Turkey dating back to all periods of Assyrian history, from ancient times until the present day. Now, with the focus of Assyrian political aspirations in Iraq and Syria after the First World War, especially, much of the Assyrian heritage in Turkey has been neglected or sidelined in favor of that in the former two countries. As a result, Assyrians from Iraq and Syria, depending on their religious denomination, or on their uh, political stance, whether they're nationalists or not, seem to have forgotten or are ignorant about the sheer amount of sites relating to their history and heritage, which are still to be found here in Turkey, let alone the fact that there are still a number of their ethnic brethren residing here. This even extends to those Iraqi or Syrian Assyrians who have direct roots from regions in Turkey, such as Hakkari and Botan. 
And this is in stark contrast to other ethnicities, such as the Armenians or the Greeks, who have been actively documenting and mapping their abandoned heritage sites in the country now for decades. Nevertheless, it is worth mentioning that there are now about 30,000 Assyrians currently residing in Turkey, of which 5,000 are Iraqi and Syrian refugees scattered in about 40 cities and towns all over the country. The rest are Turkish citizens, of which about 20,000 reside in Istanbul. The rest can be found in cities such as Izmir, Aydin, Didim, Ankara, Antalya, Adana, Mersin, uh, Iskenderun and Antakya, with a significant concentration in the southeastern provinces of Mardin, Shirnak, Diyarbakir, Adiyaman, and Elazığ in what is historic Mesopotamia. Now, it is worth noting that the majority of Turkey's Assyrians are Syriac Orthodox by religion or by denomination, with smaller numbers of Chaldean and Syriac Catholics, Protestants, and a tiny unofficial community belonging to the Church of the East. The first four denominations mentioned possess a number of community foundations dating to before 1935, most of which were founded during the Ottoman period, as well as some civil foundations and local religious and secular associations. These are mostly charged with maintaining and running, excuse me, uh, existing churches and monasteries belonging to their denominations and have been involved in a number of important projects uh, related to preserving and restoring this significant religious heritage. So what types of Assyrian heritage can be found here in Turkey? As mentioned above, tangible heritage sites, of obviously because there is tangible and intangible heritage, I'm going to talk mostly about tangible heritage, stuff that you can see and touch. Um, tangible heritage sites can be found in Turkey dating back to all periods of Assyrian history, from ancient times until the present day. Now, these include archaeological sites of ancient Assyrian settlements, such as cities, fortresses, um, and provincial capitals, as well as monasteries and churches from the early Christian period belonging to both the Church of the East and the Syriac Orthodox Church. Now, such sites include important inscriptions in languages such as Akkadian, Old Aramaic, and Syriac, as well as examples of Assyrian art and handcrafts throughout the ages, from pottery to carved reliefs, frescoes, mosaics, textiles, and decorative sculpture. Examples of Assyrian architecture to be found are not limited to imperial and religious buildings, though, but also to the secular sphere, such as, again, fortresses, domestic buildings, including the stone houses and mansions of Urfa, Diyarbakir, Mardin, and Midyat, which were all such important stops along the Silk Road historically, and even to completely abandoned or destroyed villages in regions such as Turabdin, Botan, and Hakkari. Not to be forgotten, moreover, are the large amount of Assyrian cemeteries connected to their villages, churches, and monasteries throughout the country. Now, this vast amount of Assyrian heritage falls under many different categories of responsibility and ownership. And I think that's very important to mention here. For instance, archeological and abandoned sites are largely the responsibility of the Turkish culture and tourism ministry. Many of the latter, especially abandoned churches and monasteries are now owned for the most part by the state treasury of Turkey with a small number also being owned by private individuals. On the other hand, a significant number of churches, monasteries, and cemeteries, even those in, villagery, in villages with tiny or non-existent Assyrian populations, are still owned and maintained by religious foundations and community associations, which also possess some heritage houses and commercial properties. As for the majority of Assyrian heritage houses, however, uh, these are either still owned by Assyrian individuals or have passed on to owners of other ethnicities. Thus, issues relating to ownership and responsibility for a heritage site may present problems, including legal ones, when it comes to their documentation, conservation, preservation, or restoration. And therefore, a lot of care needs to be taken uh, in this process. 
So let's ask the next question. What are the direct threats to Assyrian heritage in Turkey? The greatest factor which has threatened Assyrian tangible heritage in Turkey has been immigration due to a number of reasons. Now, the most significant of these has been the long history of, of persecution of Assyrians due to their majority Christian religion or to numerous invasions and wars which have led to their dislodgement from their villages and traditional lands. These have resulted in various waves of migration and resettlement throughout various parts of the historic Assyrian homeland from the Middle Ages until the 20th century. The most traumatic of these periods was the turbulent time between the Mongol invasions of the 13th century and the consolidation of the Ottoman Empire in the 16th century, which left many villages abandoned and religious sites ruined in regions such as Turabdin until the present day. The next most important of such shifts occurred between 1914 and 1925, during the genocidal deportations and massacres of Assyrians and others carried out during the First World War and its aftermath of Kurdish revolts, as well as the Turkish War of Independence, followed by the establishment and nation building process of the modern Republic of Turkey. This period led to mass immigrations of Assyrians to modern day Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Greece, the United States, and the former Soviet Union, and the emptying out of their villages and entire regions, such as Hakkari, Botan, and Van. These were later resettled by people of other ethnicities, largely Kurds, who often repurposed Assyrian religious sites as stables, barns, storage facilities, houses, or in some cases, mosques. In other cases, these sites were confiscated by the state, which gradually either turned them into military facilities, since they were often built in prominent and easily defensible locations, or they dismantled them and repurposed their building materials for housing or for schools. Stones from many Assyrian houses and cemeteries also met the same fate, and many of the latter have been destroyed or damaged even while building new roads. So often, whether or not an abandoned heritage site has been completely destroyed further depends on a few different factors, one of them being its geographical location or the settlement of a Kurdish tribe around it, also the material it was built from, for instance, in easily accessible areas with large populations or where many of the buildings were built of mud brick, most of these sites have been destroyed completely. Moreover, Christian religious sites have been deliberately neglected or purposely destroyed in areas where the Kurdish tribes are particularly religious Muslims or where they were historic enemies of the Assyrians. In most of these cases, however, the repurposing of churches has ironically resulted in their preservation from destruction. So on the other hand, the least amount of damage to churches is found in villages inhabited by Kurds who either belonged to Assyrian tribes or had friendly relations with Assyrians or had distant uh, kinship relations with the Assyrians. So uh, as we know, Assyrians are not a monolith. The Kurds are also not a monolith. They're not all the same. And different Kurdish tribes have had different relations with Assyrians over the centuries, see, as since we've been neighbors for so long. Now, in other cases, villagers who were consulted indicated outside influences as the reason for which churches, for example, were destroyed, whether this was encouraged by commanders from adjacent military bases or ordered by imams sent there by the State Directorate of Religious Affairs. Other factors that have resulted in Assyrian immigration from their areas of Turkey have been economic ones due to the underdevelopment of Turkey's eastern provinces and the greater amount of opportunity in urban centers, especially Istanbul, as well as the diaspora. Moreover, discrimination of Christians during critical times, such as the Cyprus conflict between 1960 and 1974, only served to increase this trend. Another factor that accelerated this was a rise in unsolved murders between 1976 and 1998, 
during which uh, period a total of 69 Assyrians were killed or went missing, not to mention the abduction and forced conversion of girls through marriage to Muslims. It is believed that these crimes were targeted rather than being just random killings, since those murdered were often the headmen of villages, the muhtars, wealthy landowners, and the educated, including doctors as well as their family members. And many of them were either politically active, possessed considerable local agency, or had stood up to injustices against their community. And these became more commonplace after the Kurdish rebellion, which began in 1984, and the Assyrians became caught between the warring sides involved. This resulted in the dramatic emptying out of scores of Assyrian villages in Turabdin and Botan, as tens of thousands of traumatized Assyrians fled for safety in Europe. Indeed, the situation which has had the most damaging effect on the Assyrian presence in Turkey and on their heritage has been the conflict with the Kurdish Workers' Party or PKK. This erupted, as I mentioned, in 1984 and continues to this day, despite a brief peace process between 2013 and 2015. In Turkey's war on Kurdish terror, Assyrians have become the greatest losers as they have been caught in the crossfire between the government's military apparatus and their neighbors, with many of their villages in Mardin and Shurnak provinces evacuated and destroyed or confiscated by Kurdish village guards during the 1990s. Added to the mix of government forces, rebel guerrillas and village guards were additionally Islamist terrorists who styled themselves Hezbollah and habitually harassed the Syrian villages, making life unbearably difficult for their inhabitants until they eventually abandoned them. Moreover, many Assyrian villages were located in declared forbidden military zones, and as a result, many of them are still empty and abandoned, with their inhabitants now living in various European countries. Prior to this conflict, there were about 70,000 Assyrians in southeastern Turkey, whereas today, there are less than 5,000. I want you to think about that for a minute. In the 1970s, which was about 50 years ago, there were 70,000 Assyrians in southeastern Turkey. Today, 50 years later, there are less than 5,000. Due to this conflict, evacuated Assyrian villages have served as camps and hideouts for anti-government guerrillas, which has resulted in them being bombed by the Turkish military. In at least one case, an important Assyrian monastic church, Marbishu, on the border with Iran, was ruined in this manner, and it has now been almost completely destroyed to build a border side road. It is not known how many other Assyrian religious structures have shared the same fate. Besides, in the last 20 years, the trend has been toward outright and wanton damage and destruction through the banal phenomenon of treasure hunting. This, however, is not something unique, unique to Turkey. I first witnessed its effects in the Urmia region of Iran in 2002 and also in northern Iraq. Uh, but particularly in Iran, churches and graves were regularly excavated and gravestones smashed in a vain quest to find gold and valuable artifacts. According to local legends, or we can say old wives' tales, Christian Armenians and Assyrians were more hardworking and wealthier than their Muslim neighbors, who, for the most part, were Kurds, and that they buried their wealth in their church. Rather than taking it with them to support the book. Did you did you miss a part of my presentation or twenty five? Say, what was the last thing you heard? Right, right. So, according to local legends, Christian Armenians and Assyrians were more hardworking and wealthier than their Muslim neighbors, who, for the most part, were Kurds and that they buried their wealth in their churches and cemeteries before fleeing their homes during the First World War, rather than taking it with them to support themselves, which is actually more logical. This racist narrative ignores the fact that in many areas, 
the Christians were indigenous, long settled peoples who had many skills that were descended from the ancient civilizations of the area, unlike the Kurds who had begun to immigrate to their areas during the Middle Ages, first as nomadic tribes, surviving on animal herding and brigandry, and only later settling. Nevertheless, it also disregards the fact that most rural Christians lived in extreme poverty and were often prey to the deprivations of neighboring Kurdish tribal landlords who routinely overtaxed or plundered them. Furthermore, there is an entire support network of web pages and forums for aspiring treasure hunters where photographs of supposed finds and potential sites are posted as well as tips on how to conduct this illegal activity. Particularly disturbing are guides which detail different types of cross designs as indicators of what kind of treasure must be buried under them or hidden in the walls behind them. They have no idea what a cross is and they will just refer to it as an isharet, a sign, a sign that there is gold or treasure behind it or under it. Inscriptions and graffiti are particularly viewed as indicators of some type of treasure, making them first pickings for destruction or for removal from any kind of structure. This has also given rise to the proliferation of fake manuscripts and fake artifacts, as well as maps complete with writing in bogus languages, which have in encouraged the practice. And these are often sold on the black market. Um, unfortunately, the above mentioned websites are not policed or taken offline, and many of these criminals continue their vandalism unobstructed and without any fear of being punished. Thus, we observe that this hunt in vain for fabled treasure is not solely limited to certain cases of excavation which compromise the foundations of such vulnerable abandoned buildings, but they also extend to the removal of stones from the structures themselves, which result in their collapse. Moreover, what is often found includes liturgical objects and manuscripts which were hidden for safekeeping, and these lose their value since they are removed from their archaeological and historical contexts. And again, this has rendered the Christian Assyrian heritage particularly vulnerable to being lost forever. A final factor I will describe is the building of dams for water conservation, irrigation, and electricity generation. For instance, the Ataturk Dam on the Euphrates has inundated the most important and ancient Syriac Orthodox monasteries of the Gergar district in Adiyaman province. And the Keban Dam on the same river has inundated the medieval Syriac Orthodox churches of the village of Til or Korluja in Tunjeli province. The most famous case though, has been that of the Ilisu Dam on the Tigris, which flooded important sites on the river dating to the Neo-Assyrian period, as well as the former Assyrian villages of Tel Nivro, Chattepe, Mawile, Kelechi, Radwan, Chelik, and the medieval church of St. Shalita in the village of Lower Oti or Balakle. The most important site this dam has flooded, however, is that of Hasnet Kepa or Hassan Cave, which was inhabited by Assyrians from ancient times until the mid 20th century. Unfortunately, while the city's Islamic heritage buildings, such as mosques, religious schools, tombs, and bathhouses, were meticulously, meticulously re removed and taken to the new Hassan cave on the other side of the river, and at least one old caravanserai was covered with a protective casing of cement, the same treatment was not given to the city's two freestanding churches and four cave churches, which have been left under the water of the dam unprotected. I found this fact quite disturbing when I visited the site for the first, or oh, for the last time actually, in 2019. And I find it problematic that all people will remember of the lost city of Hassan Cave in the future will be its Islamic heritage, as if its Christian Assyrian heritage was neither important nor worthy of preserving. So my next question, is what has already been done to document and preserve our heritage in Turkey. One of the leading figures in the documentation and preservation of Assyrian heritage sites in Turkey from all historical periods, and especially in Turabdin, has been Elio Elio. 
an Assyrian archaeologist who returned to the homeland from Sweden in 2008. Since then, he has made numerous trips all over the provinces of Mardin, Diyarbakir, and Shirnak to document the Assyrian heritage there, compiling lists of data and encouraging local authorities and communities to protect them and restore them in a tasteful way. It was he who spearheaded a project run by the Cultural Heritage Protection Association, KMKD, in Istanbul, and uh, it was also funded by the US Embassy in Turkey to document the Assyrian Syriac cultural heritage in Turabdin and Mardin. In 2018 and 2019, they conducted numerous field trips with a team of experts and professionals from both Turkey and abroad in order to collect data on threatened sites in these areas, resulting in the recent publication of their findings in both Turkish and English. In 2021, Elio and his colleagues in Midyat established the Turabdin Culture and Art Association in order to be able to continue this work in an official capacity. As part of that, they have saved a number of sites in Turabdin from destruction and are embarking on projects in conjunction with Mardin Museum and the Turkish Culture and Museum Ministry to have many of these places restored for culture and faith tourism. Finally, just this year, an agreement was signed by the local Syriac Orthodox Community Foundations, local dioceses and archbishops, and the Turkish Culture Ministry to have a number of important churches and monasteries in Turabdin restored and put on the tentative UNESCO World Cultural Heritage List. Other initiatives have been led by churches or individuals to restore the churches and monasteries in their villages. However, a few cases stand out. One of that, one of them is that of the abandoned village of Kalef, or Dereichi, for which there are plans to turn it into a touristic village with the cooperation of the Syriac Orthodox Archdiocese of Mardin and Diyarbakir. Another project in the works is the restoration of the historically important Mariakob Monastery near Sirt by the Chaldean Catholic Archdiocese in Turkey. Finally, Another effort which deserves mention is the interactive Turkey cultural heritage map launched online by the Harant Dink Foundation in 2016. This thoroughly researched initiative introduces the various cultural heritage sites all over the country which belong or belonged to various ethnic and religious minorities including the Assyrians, Armenians, Greeks and Jews and it is free to use for anyone interested. However, the true locations of many of the places on the map have not been given in order to avoid their discovery and destruction by treasure hunters. More recently, a Kurdish researcher from Van has made a documentary in Kurdish about abandoned Assyrian churches in Hakkari. It's called The Silent Scream. And he is preparing a book regarding this issue in Turkish in order to educate the general public, both in the Southeast as well as throughout the rest of the country regarding this threatened heritage. Apart from these, not much else has been done to document and preserve the Assyrian heritage in Turkey, especially that of Assyrians who lived, let's say, east of the Tigris River. So what more can possibly be done? As mentioned earlier, there are several initiatives aiming to document and preserve the Assyrian heritage in Turkey. However, these are largely aimed at the Christian heritage of Western Assyrians, who still possess various community and civil foundations, as well as associations throughout the country, and especially in the Southeast. These, as I said, still own many of their sites, which they continue to maintain and restore, as well as use them for worship from time to time. While there are some Chaldean Catholic foundations and members in Turkey, the vast majority of Eastern Assyrian tangible heritage is left abandoned, unattended, and open to damage and destruction by treasure hunters. Therefore, if nothing is done urgently to save these heritage sites in Hakkari, Shernak, Sirt, and Van provinces, they will be lost forever. This is dangerous on a number of levels. Firstly, these areas held the largest concentrations of Assyrians before the First World War. And secondly, these areas are culturally important as they form the piece of the cultural puzzle joining with Tur Abdin in the west, Urmi in the east, and northern Iraq in the south. 
where there are still Assyrian populations. So if this cultural heritage is destroyed, not only would future generations of Assyrians not have the privilege of being able to know the geographical and artistic context of their history, but it would also serve to further widen the cultural gap between Assyrians of different regions and would be a loss, not just for Assyrians, but for the entire world. It is thus imperative that a concerted effort be made in order to have the Assyrian tangible heritage in these areas well documented and to work towards its preservation and restoration. In 2013, I created a Facebook fan page called Assyrian Hakari and Botan, in which I shared photos, photo albums of Assyrian villages and churches in those regions. This led to an explosion of interest and thousands of likes were earned for the page in its first months of operation. Its aim was to show Assyrians originally from Hakkari and Bhutan that the places they are from and which are a cornerstone of their identities are not fairy tales, but real points on a map where if they are lucky, they can see the remains of their ancestors and maybe be prompted to visit them and preserve them. This also led to a strong positive reaction from Kurds in Hakkari too, who for the first time were able to communicate directly with the descendants of those who were their ancestors' neighbors about a century before. Since 2015, I have led about four or five pilgrimage tours to Hakkari, where we have been able to visit Assyrian villages, churches, monasteries, and cemeteries, not only with Assyrians whose heritage is from the region, but also with academics and those interested in Hakkari's Assyrian history, whether they be Assyrian or non-Assyrian. Sometimes we were able to conduct traditional lamb sacrifices on the feast days of certain saints, pray in some of the churches and light candles in order to demonstrate their sanctity and significance for us to the local people. And this has also been covered in the local media. Last year, we were able to have an ancient church, that of Marsawa, Saint Sawa, in the village of Rumta, Apertiare, completely cleaned by the local workers, and we even made a door for it with a cross on it. Since then, the church has been visited by four tour groups, and the residents of the village now want to place signs at the entrances of the village on the main road for the people that pass by to know where to stop and visit the church. I would definitely say that this is progress. In the last few months now, uh, I have started an initiative with some friends to establish a foundation that would work on documenting and preserving the neglected part of Assyrian cultural heritage in Turkey. We now have a team of five, including Western Assyrians and non-Assyrian friends, including Kurds, Turks, Muslims, who have participated together with us in the writing of the new foundation's constitution and applications for the establishment through the local court in Midyat. The foundation will be called the East Assyrian Cultural Heritage Protection Foundation, and it will focus on documenting, preserving, and bringing about the restoration of cultural monuments belonging to the Church of the East in Hakkari and Botan regions of Turkey. We have also discussed the foundation and consulted at length with His Holiness Mar Awa Royal, Catholicos Patriarch of the Assyrian Church of the East. The plan is to have a number of churches and monasteries restored and added to tourist routes, as has already been done for St. Sawa Church. This would not only preserve hitherto abandoned Assyrian tangible heritage sites, but would also contribute to the local economies in Hakkari and Chernak provinces by providing new jobs and adding to the local tourism infrastructure, as well as encouraging others to preserve these sites rather than allowing them to be destroyed by treasure hunters. Currently, our first project is to prepare for the restoration of the Saint Shalita Patriarchal Cathedral in Kochanas, which basically was the patriarchal center of the Church of the East for about 350 years. We have already signed a contract with an architect who will prepare the three necessary reports to be given to the representatives of the culture and tourism ministry in Van. These are uh, one reporting the current state of the building, another detailing its original state, and one uh, detailing how it can be restored to its former glory. 
Hopefully the architect will be here this Friday in order to start working on the first of these reports. And we thank our supporters in the USA who generously donated to have these reports completed. If the Cultural Heritage Committee in Vaughan accepts, there will be an official restoration project and we will have a budget for which we will seek funds from the cultural heritage preservation organizations abroad. Additionally, we plan to meet with the governor of Hakkari to consult with him regarding our planned projects and to try and get the provincial administration on board. Please wish us all the very best of luck. Now to my conclusions. The Assyrian cultural heritage in Turkey is one that spans several millennia and historical periods. It is quite rich and varied, and there are, a, there are a plethora of related sites which would be relevant to Assyrian history and culture that may be visited by Assyrians from other parts of the Middle East, as well as the diaspora. There, currently, there are a number of foundations and organizations linked to the few remaining Assyrians in the country, which are charged with the preservation and restoration of the related Christian heritage. However, the Eastern Assyrian heritage is largely under threat of erasure due to the fact that the Church of the East does not have an official status or entity within Turkey today. For this reason, we are now establishing a foundation which will be charged with the documentation, preservation and restoration of Eastern Assyrian tangible heritage sites in Turkey. And we are currently waiting for the court's decision as to whether or not they have accepted it. So after that, um, it will be officially launched. So watch this space. Our first projects are already underway and we plan for many more in the future with uh, hopefully the support of our brothers and sisters in the Assyrian community around the world. Anyone who would like more information on this initiative should contact me directly for now. Finally, one important point that I would like to make is as follows. Our tangible and intangible cultural heritage are precious to us and are a cornerstone of our identity. Without them, we are not Assyrians and we have no history or culture to show for our coming generations. It is the duty of every Assyrian, wealthy or not, educated or not, to take up the initiative and to be proactive in documenting and preserving what they know and what they have so it can be passed on to future generations to strengthen their, their Assyrian identity. I truly hope that the East Assyrian Cultural Heritage Protection Foundation, once officially established, fingers crossed, will strive to contribute to these efforts to a significant extent. In the meantime, I would like to invite you all to come to Turkey to see how rich it is with Assyrian history and heritage. And I am very happy to guide you around wherever you would like to go. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. Thank you, uh, Nicholas, for this really excellent presentation uh, and for being really our eyes and, and souls and connecting us with uh, as scholars and as community members uh, with areas that we have abandoned or aspects of our community have abandoned for at least a century. Uh, we thank you for, for all that you do, and I'm sure you have a lot of questions from the audience. Before I will, oh, yeah. well, Dr. Yadis? Just before, before entering discussion, I know there are many questions. I wanted to also thank Nicholas. Nicholas, Shlaman uh, Rona. Uh, we have talked about talents. I, I wasn't polite uh, and just I mentioned a few of them. And I am focusing when I talk about talent, it's in language, history, and culture or literature. We do have many, many talents in medicine. And we, we have two big uh, figures here among us uh, for medicine, three big uh, uh, figures here for medicine, but we do have a few people for this. This is why I wanted also to mention, uh, as I said, Nicholas, uh, Ario, uh, and so on, and Alda. Uh, here is Eve, uh, Susan, Anahit, uh, Julie, Shana, uh, Ronnie. We do have a huge new generation. We have to support them. We have to 
push them forward in order to be encouraged and continuing doing such a prominent work as Nicholas is doing in, uh, in Turkey. So uh, this is just, I wanted to thank you, deeply thank you. I'm very sorry that you, you couldn't come. Uh, I was a bit, at the beginning I was sad uh, that uh, such talents couldn't be with us sharing also the wise of the coffee where we could learn from them. But anyway, uh, this is better than nothing. They have given what, what was needed. And now uh, I'm, I'm going to leave you for the questions and discussions. I'm sure that there are many, many questions in relation to this topic. documentation لا اخشي توثيق من سبب اخنا نبيخ انا من ديانه بيشي ان هذه رابه من بكلاينا انا من دنا عمرانه ينذيرنا ينموت اينا باتنا الله اقلينا دختي امري بكلاينا اينا شيتا قشيتا يرخق يرخا بياشنا مخروه بياشنا ممبله هذه انا اتوا اتوا قطو سخا عمره خش لي الله مقم كما يمانه مقم اشتا شوير خخيشن و دخت دخت هنا يعني مقام إشتا شواري خخيش نوا ترجع دانا هذه أمبيلة نقد أيضا تا كلية وا دي لخ يعني كمتينا شنا وارا كمتينا يرخ وارا خش أمرخ بش بخراون أنا دكانة أخنا بايخ أنا دكانة بيشي قد تولدات تينا بتاعي خزير أخت إيوا قهادخ أنا رابا خيل مخاين لا أختي ال documentation documentation رابا سنايلا إن أخنا بيخ ودخل أنا دكان restoration بيخ بتدخل قا سياحة قا tourism قد آتي ناشي من ودر خزي أنا دكان قد أوها تخيين جاوي 
بخشان اي رابا انا نقيتها لا ومن دي قد ماروت رابا دوسيت رابا قابول المخشختوخ اخشي ان ناشد قد تودي لأهدف منتيشن قارك هاوي كواليفايد قارك هاوي قرية امن دي قارك يطي موادنا امن دي قامايا من دي تتري قهادخ اخنان شتو سوخا خشو تاسا خا وقف خا فاونديشن لخا من سبب بيخ بيخ هاو خرش مايا لخا وبيخ هاويلا يوال تشقلت من خكمت لخا من سبب لا يوال تشقلت من خكمة ولا يوال تشقلت من وزيرو تتمردوطة وتسياحة التوريزم هيش من دي لا ماسخ قودخ قهادخ قارك يطخ بمت أرخا بالخخ وبالخخ بأقل داروطة وهاويتم بسي مرابا Okay. My question is just recently in the city of Haran, they discovered uh, a university, a Syrian university, and it is one of the oldest universities ever discovered. But what is happening now that they are claiming it as a Turkish heritage. So what do you think the initiative should be to reclaim it as an Assyrian heritage rather than a Turkish uh, university or heritage? Thank you. Okay. Shall we, shall we continue? Do you want me to answer the questions together or should I answer them one by one? Yes, I think now, yeah, Anahit, you, yeah, you wanted to ask, yeah. You have 12 minutes, so. Please. Okay. Thank you. Nico excellent you. presentation, as usual. Uh, actually, I had uh, several questions before you were speaking. Look to the, yeah. Oh, okay, I want to see his face. <laughs> uh, I had uh, several questions before when you were speaking, but you answered on all of them. But my main question is, being there, do you see, okay, you are doing all this work for us, thank you so much, but, from hidden part, from state policy, do you see any kind of threat from Turkish officials? Or let's say it's a we had a cultural genocide, so from Ministry of Culture, or I don't know how they call it. The reason I'm asking, because you know, being Armenian, I know we have the same problem. I'm sure you know about that Ahtamar, uh, that they took the cross and things like that. Is there any threat from state policy? Thank you so much. And the uh, next question now. You just two, I will take the other one. Shlomo. Oh. No, take, take the two and I will take one. Shlomo, either what? Ninos, Use Musuid, Todi Luario, Todi Luni Colostene. Ushu already came down Chica Alushu, Dana Hitkola. Have you look much now of Turkey, either book Hoset, Model Mar Astro, Astrishne? ودروم دعاء ميدان من ناحية دشوا لود أردو كان إيدر بكحور إيدر بكوب عم أبرم إيدر دولة ذي. put the question in English as well. in English as well. okay. so uh, considering you've been living there in Turkey now for a couple of years, how do you see? what's your uh, point of view when it comes to uh, the gov Turkish government's uh, uh, policy? that's Anit's question and Erdogan's aspirations for the future for our people there. In uh, 10, 20 years from now. Thank you. And now is the last question. Last question. I, um, I have to uh, say something more inspirational as well. <laughs> Nicholas Shlomo Habibo, we are uh, extremely proud of you. This is the first conference ever that I have been inspired by younger people than I am myself, starting <laughs> with Elda who's younger than I am, and I'm extremely inspired by her. Ario and you, Nicholas, you have always been an inspiration since I've met you. Could you um, enlighten us about our Muslim neighbors that we have always been longing to a, a group of them to be tolerant and also helpful in uh, preserving our heritage? Is it true? Is it true that we have finally found Muslim friends, whether they are Turks or Kurds, in the homeland, helping us in preserving our heritage. Is this a reality, or are they as much endangered as we are in our homeland? Hmm. 
Now uh, is the role is yours, Nicholas. Thank you. Thank you. Firstly, I'd like to apologise to everybody because I know I have a lot of amazing pictures. Uh, I didn't have time to make a PowerPoint presentation in order to show you these places that I'm talking about for them to be more visual for you. Uh, but if you'll excuse me, I've been in Hakari for the last week doing field work. So it's been quite tiring and, and very difficult to, um, to actually produce a PowerPoint presentation. So sorry there. Um, the first question, Ramsina. Um, I think the thing is for us to write, to present, to, um, to visit these places and to claim them. We don't do that. We sit in the diaspora and we see what's being done and we say, well, that's wrong. And we don't visit, we don't claim these places for ourselves. Now, for, for instance, I've seen many Kurdish singers, let's say, make music clips with Assyrian heritage in the background, whether it be the city of Mardin, whether it be the rock cut tombs in, um, in Hilar, the, the Hilar caves, which is between Diyarbakir and Kharput, and which actually have Syriac inscriptions. Um, but you see, they are here and they're claiming them. They're, they're making, um, you know, music clips with these in the background. So uh, we're not doing that. We are too focused on the diaspora and we're too focused on certain parts of our homeland in Iraq and Syria. And we don't care enough about what's in Turkey. None of us really visit Turkey. And I know many Assyrians will come to Turkey to have hair transplants or to fix their teeth, and they will not even visit anything Assyrian in Turkey. Even in Istanbul, where you have ancient Assyrian artifacts in the Istanbul Archaeological Museum. So I think there is a problem within our community itself. Secondly, I don't think it's wrong to say that the University of Haran is part of Turkish cultural heritage. Assyrians are part of Turkey, whether they like it or not. Turkey is a country with many different ethnic groups, uh, be they Assyrian, be they Greek, be they Armenian, Laz, Kurdish, Arab, and all of these are part of the heritage of the country of Turkey. Okay, so for Turkey to, to claim the University of Haran as its uh, cultural heritage, well, even though there was no Turkey at the time, and even though maybe there were no ethnic Turks living in the area at the time that it existed, there is a country now called Turkey, and it does rule over an area where this is included. And if that is there, then it is a part of the country's cultural heritage as a country. End of story. But I think us as Assyrians have to be more active if we want that. So, Second question was Anahit, Pshena uh, Azista Anahit. Um, you know, I don't like to think of negative things, uh, but what I do want to uh, draw your attention to is the fact that Assyrians in Southeastern Turkey, especially in the last 20 years, have had a very positive image in, uh, in, the, in the media, in uh, different parts of Turkish society. Um, and what we can say is that, you know, Assyrians have been encouraged to return and rebuild their villages. Uh, you know, they've been encouraged to uh, rebuild or restore their churches and monasteries. The Syriac Orthodox Church is now involved in building a mega church in Istanbul, which is basically eight stories three underground, five above ground, including the roof. It's a mega church. So I don't think as Assyrians, we have very many problems with the government or with the Republic of Turkey. We are not Armenians. And I'm, I'm sorry to say it that bluntly. Armenians have a very vocal and very aggressive uh, diaspora community, which is actively working against Turkey. And well, if I was Turkish, I would be offended myself. Whether or not I was right or wrong, 
we still need to remember, you know, the way that these uh, diaspora organizations and their lobby groups are approaching these issues which they are fighting for. So, no, we are not Armenians. We don't have that, thankfully. We don't have a state like Armenia. Even if all the Armenian heritage in Turkey is destroyed, there is still an Armenia where they can preserve that. Even if all the Greek heritage in Turkey is destroyed, there is a Greece where they can preserve that. Even if all the Jewish heritage in Turkey is destroyed, there is an Israel where they can preserve that. There is no Assyria where we can preserve our heritage. So whether we like it or not, we have to work with the authorities and we have to work with the representatives of the Turkish government and its cultural ministry if we want to preserve our heritage. And I think that's being realist. I'm sorry, but Armenia is not going to come to Turkey and preserve my heritage for me. So I think we need to know that. Now for the question by Dr. Ninos. Uh, Dr. Ninos, as I said, uh, I don't like to get involved in politics. Uh, however, I think we need to be very pragmatic. Uh, governments come and go, presidents come and go. What we need to think about is how we plan for the future and how we can build a solid foundation, a solid basis for us to be able to continue working in the future whether it be the current government or whether it be a future government from a different political standpoint. I think we shouldn't really think about that as much as we should think about what we want to do and what we want to achieve on the ground. So I think we should be more pragmatic and open to working with whoever is in power at the time. And I don't think it's important for us to focus on this government or this party or that. Because at the end of the day, if I'm able to preserve my heritage, thank you very much. That's all I want. You know, uh, last question. Sorry. Last question. Last question, Professor. Yes. Last question by Dr. Mate. Dr. Mate, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and it's a pleasure to see you again after so many years, Aziza. Um, I think, look, we need to engage in dialogue with everybody, be they uh, Kurdish Muslims, be they Assyrian Muslims, be they Muslims from any other background, Turkish, whatever. I think, look, a lot of, especially the Muslims in Hakkari, have never seen Assyrians. They call us Armenians, for heaven's sake, because they use the word Fallah in Kurdish. And for them, Fallah is a Christian, but for them, a Christian is an Armenian. So a lot of them don't even know that the Christians that lived here were Assyrians and not Armenians. And that's a big problem. So I think, you know, you won't develop friends, you won't develop friendships by sitting in the diaspora and watching. You need to come here, you need to build those friendships, you need to have those conversations, you need to have that dialogue on the ground with people here. And what I really want to tell you, it's very important, Assyrians always like to say, these people are our friends, these people don't like us, these people are our enemies, what, whatever. <clears throat> these people like us. I think the important thing is for us to be our own friends and to like ourselves. And once we do that, then it won't matter because other people will like us. I think we really need to work on ourselves and work on strengthening our our. Uh, bonds within ourselves as a, as a community and as a people and to strengthen ourselves that way. Once we're strong, people will want to be our friends. We won't be going begging them to be our friends. So I hope that uh, that message, I, I was able to get that message across. So thank you very much again for this opportunity to be with you today. It's been an honor and a pleasure and I hope you, uh, I wish you all the best of, of success for the rest of the conference. Thank you very much. Shlame from Hakkari. Dear Nicholas, thank you very much for, as usual, excellent uh, conference. As you see, uh, yes, Mata, you're right. I remember when you mentioned it that uh, you were the youngest. Now there is another generation when I met you for the first time in Spain. I said, there is a hope. There, there was the in-between generation now. Uh,
we are happy to have such talents among us. This is the way where we can do something, this is the way where we can build, and especially in a positive way. Uh, thank you, Nicholas, again for this uh, occasion, because when I asked him to, give, to come, he said, yes, I will come, and then he couldn't come, but he promised to give a conference and he accomplished his promise. So next time, uh, we would love to have you among us, Nicholas, because we would then enjoy much more your knowledge and uh, your expertise in different fields. Uh, again, thank you. And now, uh, questions, practical issues, time is uh, running. Uh, just I wanted to tell you, as you, ha you might have realized or seen uh, at, at the entrance, uh, there are some engravings that are there. You have seen uh, Lamassu, uh, the herd lino, and then uh, Abkallu, and uh, the, the Assyrian tree of life. These engravings, gravure, uh, are uh, done especially in order to have the occasion to contribute also to the Nivecia. So if some of you would uh, buy some of them, the Nivecia. This is why we, I asked my wife to do it as a gift for, for the Nivecia and you are most welcome to, to have some of them. Next uh, issue, which is uh, important uh, now, as yesterday, stomach is calling. Uh, an important issue. We, have, we are going to have lunch in a special place. Uh, as you are special guests, we have booked in a special place. Just follow us. Uh, Bega, uh, she knows where, and also uh, Diego, they will help us and also uh, Teresi and uh, Jorge, who are uh, somehow helping us to, you know, uh, to have this excellent, marvelous conference and also practical for practical issues. Uh, we are going to Fonseca, where some of you are hosted. Is there where we are going to have lunch, and then we will continue our sessions of, uh, in the afternoon. I'm very sorry to to bother you with so many conferences, but this is the way which or what I understand under uh, Congress. Uh, yesterday I was, uh, you remember when, when we started the inauguration, the Dean said, it's too much. No, I think we, we could have even more because we are somehow uh, hungry and thir we have, we're thirsty for, for, for such uh, deep knowledge. So if you all get a bit tired, I'm very sorry, sorry for you, but this is Salamanca and this is the Nineveh chair, which will push forward in this way. Uh, thank you again, uh, Nicholas. And she is, okay. No, no, no.